theme of the sermon for today, what I have put is, Christian life is to serve others. So that is my theme and I am going to uh, show 10 principles. You clearly see that Christian life is not for ourselves, but Christian life is for others. Christian life is to serve others. So that is the theme of my sermon today. <coughs> okay, to start with, we all know, the, everyone tend to think, the moment God blesses us financially, the moment God blesses us in our profession, the moment God blesses us in the prosperity, the moment God blesses in our children in their education, we think that we are saved people, and we are in the deception, and the Satan in this case gives the deception. In this case I am saying it is Satan, not the self. But the Satan gives a deception saying that you are a saved person, don't worry. See, God is blessing you. You are financially blessed. You have a lot of buildings, prosperity, cars, your children are studying well and everything. Yes, that could be also, true also. But the, there is other side of a danger maybe it is a deception that our interpretation of the uh, salvation is totally different to the biblical teaching because the moment we are saved people we are supposed to live for others christian life is other centric Christ christian life is not self centric christian life is not self righteous so with that background let us go First Matthew 22, 38 to 39. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So the first principle under Christian life is to serve others, is to love for one another. Okay, the first thing is love for one another. So Jesus himself is telling in Matthew 22 that the greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. How do you love yourself? You put lot of, we all put lot of powders, creams, we don't want when we go out for uh, sun, we don't want the sun to harm our skins. We put lot of lotions, thousands of rupees we spend on our self. We decorate ourselves through good uh, clothes, ornaments, creams, lotions, powder and everything. We care a lot about ourself, our body and we love our body. So what I am trying to tell you is how much care do we give to our body, our self body, human body of ourself. You are supposed to give the same sort of Love when you are supposed to be part of the local church or the universal church where you are supposed to love one another. So you need to show to that extent how you are loving your body. You are supposed to love others also in similar way. So Philippians 2.3, in the same, under the concept of love itself, I will give three scriptures. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourself. So, um, the Philippians 2.3 is saying, do nothing out of selfish means, when you are working with brothers or sisters as part of the local church or primarily all this context is applied to local church and the universal church, it is good even if you apply the same principles even with unbelievers while you are, while you are dealing with them. But this all the scriptures primarily is emphasized in the body of Christ. So, value others in humility than yourself means the problem with the mankind because of the sin is we have lot of egos, we have lot of comparisons. Hey, Anthony is theologian, I want to teach better than Anthony, I, my sermon should be better than Anthony. That is the mindset. I need to preach better than Kranti. And like, you know, uh, that sister is wearing uh, clothes, I need to wear better clothes than her. She has this sort of ornaments, I need to have more ornaments than her. So we tend to compare. But Philippians, Paul is very clearly telling, 
that in humility value others more than yourself the case there is a second part in philippians but in the first part if you see do nothing out of selfish ambition when you are trying to work with something with your brother do not expect anything in return that is the selfish ambition what i will get out of this if i am working on something with my brother or sister then i should not expect in return anything in trying to do something for others okay again the th third scripture in the same the concept of love one another is dear friends since god so loved us we also ought to love one another because god loved us we are sinful people we see in romans 5 god loved us even before we were still living in our trespasses and sin so when god loved us when we are still living in our sin we also when we know god we are supposed to love one another if you claim that you are a saved person then you are supposed to love one another in the body of christ this can be the local church or the universal church but if you claim yourself that you love god then you are supposed to love one another i will show you one dangerous scripture in the same context of loving one another is whoever claims to love god it hates his brother or sister is a liar if we claim that we love god and if we hate brother or sister in christ as part of the body of christ in both local or universal church then we are liars there is no truth in us because we are lying that we love god by hating our brothers and sisters we have bitterness against our brother in christ we have bitterness against sisters among one another there is bitterness don't though we don't reflect outside we tend to have bitterness against one another as part of brothers or sisters as part of the local church but then uh, the scripture is very clearly telling that we are liars if we claim that we love god and we hate our brothers and sisters for whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love god whom they have not seen so when you say that you love your brother and sister whom you see how can you love god whom you have not seen if you do not love god then how can you tell that you are a saved person so the principle what it means is if you claim to love god then you are supposed to love one another if you don't love one another then 1 john 4:20 is telling that you do not know god when you do not know god then how can you consider yourself as a saved person that means you are in the deception that means you are not a saved person that means the god's wrath is still hanging on your neck but we are thinking that we are saved people so there are 59 scriptures i often tell probably you always hear from me that there are 59 scriptures which speaks about love one another in the body of christ 59 scriptures means what a great emphasize it is there in the new covenant that is the reason what jesus himself said matthew this is the first and the greatest commandment and the second is like it love your neighbor as yourself there is a great prominence which is there in loving one another the deed should speak it is not the words it is the deeds which should speak about our love if a brother or sister as part of the body of christ is struggling with financial problem with some spiritual warfare or struggling with some worldly trials or struggling with some temptations or some challenges and if you say you love god and if you don't love your brother if you don't encourage that brother then what faith you have what salvation do you have when you claim that you love your brother and sister in christ
we saw in James, we had a lengthy discussion when we spoke about the faith and works where James tells, if you claim that you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, where is the good work? So when you see some brother or sister as part of the body of Christ struggling, then you are supposed to manifest your love in the form of a good deed by visiting them, by praying over them, by supporting them, by encouraging them, by giving hospitality to them, by keeping a constant follow-up with them to see how are they living. Suppose one day if Mary's sister is not joining, then the rest of the women are supposed to call her back and understand why she did not join, is there any struggle or battle or she is not well, that I am supposed to call her back and check, rather we leave it as it is. That is the manifestation of the deed of love when you claim that you love God, is to love one another in the form of deed by verifying why so and so brother or sister did not join. So that's the first under the Christian life is to serve others. The second I'm taking is obedience. The scriptures is Romans 13, 8 to 10. Romans 13, 8 to 10. Let no one, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. Do you see again here is we need to be continuing in loving one another. For whoever loves, whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other commandments there may be are summed up in this one command, you love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not harm a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. What is the meaning of fulfillment of the law? So I think we, we are learning a lot about law and grace. Here, in exa here is an example of the law when it speaks. Here it is the law of God. Always when we speak about the, the, the word law in the new covenant, it refers to the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. This, the law spoken in the New Covenant is not just limited to the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament, but the law of God, when it is spoken in the New Testament, is always the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Great Commission, it is a command which God said, go and preach the Gospel. That is a command, so that is the law of God. Love one another is the law of God, my dear brothers and sisters. Love one another is a command, it's an instruction, it's an action for all the believers to perform. Love one another is not theory, it is practical. So, the second point of obedience towards God's law, the moment you love one another, then you are obedient to God's law. You are fulfilling the law of God where God said love one another and when you love one another in the body of Christ, both in local church and universal church, then you are obedient to God's law. There, that's how you are fulfilling the law which is spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ. That is Paul telling in Romans 13. Okay. The third point, 2 Corinthians, 1st chapter, verse 3 to 4. So, Christian life is, first thing is to love one another. Christian life is to be obedient to God's law. Third is, Christian life is to comfort others. Okay? We see in 2 Corinthians, 1st chapter, verse 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God 
of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from the god there are two things which you are supposed to understand from this scripture first thing is if there is no christ in you if there is no god in you if you are not a saved person when you are living with adam sin without christ what comfort will you give to a person who needs a comfort so the first part of the scripture verse 3 is claiming that we as a believers of lord jesus christ we tend to get the comfort from the god from the god head from the triune god see that praise be to god and father of our lord jesus christ the father of compassion in spite of our unfaithfulness in spite of our day to day struggles and battles in spite of the sin what we commit in our day to day life still the god is a god of compassion he still gives comfort from the heaven so god has the bundles of comfort in the heaven and who comforts us in all our troubles so it is god, we need to receive first we need to receive the comfort from god in order for us to comfort others when we ourselves do not have the comfort how can we comfort the others the problem with the church is the entire universal church i am speaking the majority of the believers so called believers who traditionally feel they are the saved people i have always a deep burden and anguish in my heart when i look at the mega churches where they are so committed as the law as a tradition they wake up early in the morning they bath they eat they dress well they compute in traffic and spend one hour in the traffic to reach the church and they listen the sermon and they go but they don't participate as part of the body ministry there is no love one another because when you sit besides today next sunday whom you are sitting besides you do not know how how are you manifesting the love one another as part of the mega churches that there is a body ministry happening there and when you yourself are not using your gift you are not spending time in reading the word of god not spending time in the prayer not spending time in encouraging one another then how will you receive the comfort from the heaven we see here paul is very clearly telling you receive the comfort from the heaven when will you receive comfort from the heaven when you have good fellowship with god when you have good interpersonal relationship with god suppose let us imagine if i need to seek something from anthony if anthony has some treasure how can i gain the treasure if i don't have a good in good intimate relationship with anthony i spend time lot of time talking to him lot of time visiting him lot of time talking to him chatting to him then our my relationship with anthony will increase the moment my relation with anthony increases then anthony is going to share his treasure similarly if i don't spend time in fellowship with the lord who is a god of all comfort you don't get the comfort or encouragement from any individual we still in live in adam's flesh we still battle we still struggle what treasure do you have the treasure of the comfort within yourself that you comfort others unless you seek unless you have the comfort from heaven how can you give comfort to the others so first you need to get the comfort from god of the heaven because he has all the treasures of the comfort in the heaven you receive the comfort in all your trials and tribulations so that you can comfort others 
Christian life is to comfort others. That is what you see in the second part. So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from the God. Means, first you receive the comfort from the heaven by having close fellowship with God, by reading the word of God, by spending time in the prayer and having good relationship with God, that you get the comfort from the God in all trials, in all troubles, and then you tend to give the comfort to the others. The problem with all of us is, we do not spend much time with the God, we do not get comfort from God, that is the reason we don't want to go and comfort others. If we tell go, if we tell anyone as part of the church, just telling an example, let me call some name, Anthony again, once again. Anthony, let us go and comfort so and so brother, he, is, he, is, he, he seems to be weak. When uh, Anthony brother himself doesn't have the comfort from God where he's not spending time, then how can he comfort the others? That is what Paul is very clearly telling. That is the situation and the sad state of the universal church. There is no time. We are busy in our life to earn money and education and all the pleasures of this world that we don't seek and get the comfort from the heaven. So we don't comfort others. We don't want to go and encourage others because we ourselves are not encouraged from God. I feel sad when I see there are pro where, when I when I see there are problems in the body of Christ. When I see problems in brothers or sisters, if you claim you are a born again believer, then you are supposed to spend some time in God to take the comfort from God and pray that so and so sister is not well. God, I need your comfort that I can go and pass the same comfort to that person. But we don't do that. Every individual struggles. So Christian life is not self-centric, but Christian life is all about serving others. The fourth point, section, edify the body of Christ or serve the other. So we see 1 Peter 4.10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in the various forms. I often speak body ministry. Everyone who is a born-again believer is gifted. We as a believer, we need to know our gifts. If among you, if you do not know what your gifts are, ideally the Holy Spirit which is within you will clearly indicate your spiritual gifts. I can tell, Anthony also can tell, what are the gifts of each person as part of this church. And if you do not know what are your gifts, you can speak to us. We will help you to know your gifts. So, Peter is telling, each of you, each of you means only some people, only pastors, or is it every person who is a saved person? Each of you, everyone. So each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. Suppose if there is a gift of encouragement which is there, let's take Radhika, then she need to use that gift of encouragement to encourage others. Similarly, if someone has a gift of preaching teaching, he is supposed to preach and teach, to serve others, to encourage others, to comfort others. Does this happen as part of this mega church? Whether this principle of edifying one another as part of the body of Christ, we clearly see that each of you should use whatever gift you have received, received from where? received as part of the salvation is to serve others. If you have any gift, if you keep in almara or if you keep deep within your heart and if you don't use it, what is the use? You are not being a blessing to other person. You are not serving the other person by your gift. If God has given you a gift of prophecy, 
you need to use it for the edification of the body. If God has given you a gift of prayer, you need to use it for encouraging one another through your prayer. I want each one of you to introspect yourself while I am speaking on all these things rather than just hearing from one ear and just say, oh, each one of you to be fruit-bearing Christian life. <coughs> okay? Each one of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards. You need to be faithful. Means uh, why the scripture is telling you need to be faithful? Means you need to use the spiritual gift. Only then you are called the faithful stewards of God's grace. If you receive any gift and if you don't use it, then you are not the faithful steward of God's grace. Means, again, I will relate this also to the salvation issue. If you claim yourself that you are a saved person and every saved person has a spiritual gift, maybe it is an encouragement, maybe it is a prophecy, maybe it is administration, maybe it is preaching, maybe it is governance, maybe it is music, maybe it is singing. There are several gifts, spiritual gifts, which we are supposed to use to edify one another. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you have a hymn or a word of instruction or a revelation or a tongue or an interpretation, everything must be done so that the church may be built up. When you come together as church, encourage one another with a hymn by the worship, with a word of instruction, either through Lord's Supper as an instruction or through a sermon, a revelation, a prophecy, a tongue or an interpretation, everything is it is is the scripture speaking about everything or some things when church gathers together as part of local church is every gift needs to get manifested or only some gifts need to be manifested everything everything we cannot keep silent only anthony using all his time or only me using all my time it is everyone it is everyone must, everything must be done. Means every spiritual gift which is given. So every spiritual gift which is given must be used for the edification of the body of Christ. You see that. You see it here. It's not me who is making the statement, but it is Paul who is telling. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. Now imagine, if you are part of a big church, can everything be possible? Can the church be built up? Now Mary's sister has a gift of prophecy, let us say, or a gift of singing. Mary's sister goes to Calvary Church. God is giving a revelation to her to build the church. See, every gift is to build the church, right? Here you are seeing it. I am making it bold. Every gift is to build the church. Now Mary's sister is going to Calvary Church. And then God is, she is enjoying in God's presence through the worship. And God is giving her a revelation where she is supposed to prophesy to the entire church of Calvary. The moment she stands up and starts the prophecy, the CS team will come and say, Sister, be silent. Sit. Am I wrong in my interpretation or am I right in my interpretation? Are only the people on the stage, only the worship team on the stage, or only the pastor of the church is supposed to drive the church and build the church, or it is everyone. We saw each gift in the previous scripture, First Peter, we saw each of you should means everyone. Here Paul is telling every gift, means every person, every gift should be used to build the church. Next theme, Christian life is to be generous and to share others. You see here, 1 Timothy 6, 
17 to 19. Command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth. Means anyone who are rich in this world not to keep their hope, not, not their security on the wealth, which is uncertain. So the riches, whatever you tend to have, there is no certainty in them. Will you carry your riches? If you die today, will you take all your riches to heaven? No, right? So, let your security, let your hope be not on the wealth. That is what Timothy is telling here. But, to put the hope in the God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So, God blesses you for your enjoyment. If God is blessing you financially, you enjoy over it, but let your heart, let your hope, let your security be not on the wealth, but be only on the God. Okay? You continue to see again. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds. It is not about your wealth, but it is all about your good deeds. So a Christian believer is supposed to do good deeds. You see here, we also saw when we spoke about faith and good works also. As a believer, Titus 2.14 and Titus 3.14, if you want to write the scriptures also, is we need to be zealous to do good works. We need to be passionate to do good works as a believer. But the good works will not save you, will not give you salvation, nor will you be saved. But as a saved person, you need to be zealous to do good works. If you have riches in this world, do good works by giving it to the poor who do not have it. That is a good deed. There are so many people who are in the orphanages. There are so many people who are in the missionaries. They have scarcity of food, the scarcity of money. Uh, command them to do good, to be enriched, to do good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. This is purely related to your heart. Willing to share. Willing to share means you need to be eager to share to others. When you see some person or an individual or a family as part of the local church or the universal church is struggling with finances and if you if you have God blessed you then you are supposed to share it to others. That is God's expectation when you say you are a saved person. In this way they will lay treasures, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Means, what Timothy is telling is, your treasures should not be in this world. The moment you share your finances to others, to help others in doing good deeds to the missionaries, to the orphanages, or to the poor, or to the local church, or to the universal church, then you are, sh then you are uh, treasuring your treasure in the heaven which is upcoming. Do not store your treasures in this world, but store your treasures in the heaven. That is what the scripture is telling. Next one is correcting others. So when you see a brother or sister committing sin, correcting one another as part of the body of Christ. We spoke, we, we spoke lengthy on this topic. Um, is correction needed in the church? How the correction need to be done? And... Uh, Correction is going to be a blessing in a believer's life. We saw this, right? So I'll quickly go through. I'll read the scripture. I will not explain. I w you guys can go to my YouTube channel and refer two to three sermons on this topic. Uh, you will have a lot of scriptures over there. But I will just read and move on. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. Just between the two of you, if they listen to you, you have won that over. Set? So... If you see some brother or sister as part of the body of Christ is committing sin, you should not keep quiet thinking that I am also sinning, I will not correct. But then you are supposed to go and correct and restore their person back. Galatians 6.1 Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught up in sin, you who live by the Spirit, 
here the scripture it is telling by flesh or by the spirit. I want you to relate always when I speak about this, the law is of the flesh, the spirit is of the grace. Do you guys remember? Galatians 3.23, right? You see the scripture even here, that's the reason I always tell. If you want to have a clear understanding of law and grace, please read Galatians whole, whole book. So, okay, you continue. If you see here, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore the person gently. <coughs> but what yourself, or you, you may also be tempted. So the point here is, two things. You need to, you should not keep silent, but you need to restore. And at the same time, out of uh, context, not to this uh, subject of today, but the subject of law and grace, you see here, the law is of the flesh, but the spirit is of the grace. I'm just emphasizing the glory of God, which is on the grace. Okay? So Christian life is to correct others. Okay? Not keep silent. The next one is Ephesians 6.18. Christian life is pray for others. Ephesians 6.18. And pray in the spirit again. Pray in the flesh or pray in the spirit? Pray in the spirit on all occasions. Some occasions or all occasions. Okay? All occasions. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Are you supposed to only pray for yourself and your family members and your children? Or are you supposed to pray for only your local church or for all the people? All reflects the universal church. We cannot be selfish to pray only for ourselves, our families or our local church. But we need to be concerned, we need to be burdened for the universal church. Next, uh, Christian life is all about being in unity. I always tell Ephesians 1 speaks about one God, one gospel, one spirit, one faith, one grace, one unity. So the context is very much elaborated. I don't know how many of you remember I spoke uh, in the last Sunday itself as part of the Lord's Supper exhortation when we meet for Lord's Supper it is for three things the first thing is remembering of his death and resurrection the second thing is awaiting his return and the third thing is the unity in the church when you meet together when you meet together let it be not for harm but let it for encouragement that you are reunited in the love of Christ, that you serve one another. Okay? So, Christian life is to be in unity with one another. And then, Christian life is servant attitude. Last two scriptures. Christian life is all about servant attitude. 1 Corinthians 9.19 Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to, ev a slave to a everyone to win as many as possible. So if we claim ourselves as the saved people and if you go with arrogance, if we go with pride saying that I have this much property, I have this much building, I have this much uh, big cars and you try to go and talk to people and you try to go and uh, present the gospel, do you think they will listen? Here it is a servant. When a servant, when a servant uh, needs money, does he come and request? Is it a request mode or a demand mode? It is a request mode. When you are preaching the gospel also, it is like a servant attitude. Count others above yourself. With that attitude, you, with humility, with love, with affection, you are supposed to present the gospel. So Christian life is a slavery 
don't think slavery means something low it is an indication of your humility jesus himself was the feet of the disciples who are we to have the guilt or anything to call ourselves slave we are the chil- we are the sons of the living god we are positionally the sons of the living god the moment we accept christ jesus but because jesus came as the servant we also need to live as servants as part of the christian life okay the last one galatians 5:13 christian life is set from all freedom there is no bondage and slavery or yoke of anything you are not obligated under any anything you are set free from everything you are set free from all the law there is freedom in christ jesus but don't use this freedom to use it for the flesh you see it you galatians 5:13 you my brothers and sisters were called to be free but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh do you see here flesh is coming here you often see while you are reading the bible flesh and spirit always tend to come so flesh is a representation of your mortal body which is sinful right so do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh means because there is freedom in christ jesus don't use it for committing sin to fulfill the pleasures of the flesh that is what paul is telling very clearly rather use it to serve one another in humility that is what the scripture is ending serve one another humble in love so you see very clearly there is freedom in christ jesus but to not to indulge in sin but in humility to love one another to serve one another so i will summarize in a minute christian life is to love one another christian life is to be obedient to god's law christian life is to comfort others christian life is to edify others christian life is to be generous and to share to others christian life is to restore the person caught up in sin christian life is to pray for others christian life is to be united in the life of christ christian life is the servant attitude christian life is freedom in christ